welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. Back in the early days of computing, data was input using punch cards or switches or reels of rapidly moving paper tape with output printed on a teletype device. Since that time, we've developed increasingly fluid methods for human-computer interaction, with keyboards, rodents, monitors and touchscreens now dominating our digital lives. But what if we could link the computational wetware in our own heads directly with a computing device? Well, in this video, I'm going to discuss the development of brain-computer interfaces intended to achieve just this. Oh, and along the way, I'm also going to test out a consumer brain-computer interface that's already on the market. Brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, may currently be either input or output devices. Input BCIs are comprised of sensors that acquire electrical brainwave signals, together with processing hardware that extracts distinct features and translates them into useful commands. The other way around, output BCIs translate digital information into electrical signals that are fed into the user's brain via electrode arrays or other stimulator hardware. BCIs may be constructed using one of two approaches. The first is non-invasive and may employ electroencephalography, or EEG, to acquire brainwave signals from sensors positioned on the outside of the skull. Alternatively, non-invasive BCIs may feed electrical signals into the brain using a TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation device. The second way to build a BCI is invasive and currently requires surgery to position sensors or stimulators inside the skull. Two output technologies have so far been trialled, with the first, known as electrocorticography, or ECOG, placing a strip or grid of electrodes on the surface of the brain. Alternatively, intracortical microelectrodes can be implanted a few millimetres into the brain, where they may serve as either sensors or stimulators. For obvious reasons, today most BCI research is non-invasive. This limits its scope and application, but even so, some interesting results have been achieved. Perhaps most notably, many researchers have used EEG to acquire so-termed P300 brainwaves, which are then processed to allow a user to input letters or commands into a computer. Such interfaces are painstakingly slow, but without doubt, they can work. Researchers at the University of Washington have even used non-invasive BCIs to send commands from one person's brain to another over the internet. Specifically, in a set of experiments in 2014, one test subject wore an EEG skullcap while watching a monitor screen on which a computer game was being displayed. But the fire button was in the hand of a second subject seated half a mile away in another building and who had a TMS coil placed over their brain. To shoot down rockets, the first user had to think about pressing the fire button. When they did so, brainwave signals were acquired by EEG, processed and transmitted over the internet. In turn, the TMS device induced an electrical pulse into the receiving subject's brain, so causing them to experience visual stimuli and press the fire button. Amazingly, the split-second accuracy required to shoot down rockets was achieved. In fact, across three pairs of test subjects, a success rate of between 25 and 83% was obtained. In time, University of Washington researchers hope to use BCIs to transmit more complex ideas and thoughts from one brain to another. This could even allow for what they call brain tutoring, in which knowledge is transferred directly from the brain of a teacher to the brain of a student. The team at the University of Washington use highly sophisticated sensors, stimulators and processing hardware. However, basic EEG BCIs are now available for consumers, including the Emotive Epoch, the Interexon Muse and the NeuroSky Mindwave. Such low-end hardware may actually record electromyographic signals from muscles in addition to, or even in place of, electroencephalographic signals from the brain. However, in the interest of research, I thought that I should try one out. So, here we have the NeuroSky MindWave 2 Brainwave Starter Kit. This is the most straightforward and the cheapest consumer BCI on the market 
right now. So let's have a look inside the box, see what we get. Very exciting, what's in here? And, um, oh, look, it's got a, a quick start guide. I'm glad there's a quick start guide for a brain interface. And then we have a black foam and, uh, oh, more black foam and the things are inside the black foam, black on black on black. And it's a, oh, a sort of soft touch plastic. Let's get the thing out. And uh, there we are. There's the, uh, the Mindwave headset. This is presumably a sort of thing. Oh, yes, that comes out like that. Look, this, I think, uh, ends up on your uh, forehead. So I think the best thing right now is for me to put this on and see how it works. So, I'm now wearing the NeuroSky Mindwave headset and it has a single EEG sensor just above my left eyebrow there, but there's also a connection onto my earlobe, which I presume gives them a relative potential. I'm sure they're not suggesting that there's uh, any brain cells in my left earlobe. And uh, the thing has a battery here, it's a wireless device, and it's connected by Bluetooth to this app, which is running on an Android tablet. And what we have here is four displays, and uh, the first one here is the uh, really wacky one, which is a brainwave visualization, showing all the different frequency brands of my brainwave in a really science fiction looking display. I really like that uh, display. And then we also have a bar chart. This is showing you my brainwave power spectrum, and the, the line you can see going across here is actually um, showing me at least, a, at least a, a measure of the voltage value coming off my, my brain. It's a bit strange to think that's a measure of part of my brainwave signal, but apparently it is. And then down here at the bottom, we have two gauges, one for attention. This is a, basically a measure of how much I'm focusing on a particular thing, how much I'm holding my level of attention, which is going up quite a bit there as, as I, I think about this. And uh, finally, there's a meditation gauge, which is a, a measure of how calm I am, how relaxed my mind is. And uh, this consumer brain interface, like most of them on the market, basically allows you to control things in various apps. There's over 100 apps available for this device. It allows you to control them by basically learning to control what we see on that attention gauge and what's on the meditation gauge. So let's see if I can push the attention really high. So I'll uh, go out of real time for a second, see if I can push it up and up and up and up. And uh, there we are, it took a second, but I managed to hit the top of, of the tension. Now let's see if I can uh, raise the meditation one right way up to the top. So again, I'll drop out of real time. And there we are, I've managed to uh, top out the meditation gauge as well. And I'm sure if I spent a bit more time at this, I could get better at controlling these two gauges and use them to control very simple apps. This said, this kind of EEG consumer brain interface is not going to change the world. It's not going to really change how we interface with computers. So I think we should move on to look at far more sophisticated, invasive brain computer interfaces. For many years, we've been learning how to interface electronic hardware with the human body. Not least, since 1982, over 300,000 people have had their hearing restored with a cochlear implant. These feature a surgically inserted electrode array that delivers electrical pulses to its host's auditory nerves. The cochlear implant electrode array is connected to a surgically inserted receiver stimulator, which receives wireless signals from an external sound processor connected to a microphone. Some external sound processors can also receive and transmit audio directly from a computer. So already, some people have a computer feeding sound directly into their auditory nerves. A company called Second Sight is also developing visual implants. Indeed, since 2011, more than 75 patients have been fitted with a Second Sight retinal prosthesis system called the Argus II. This is implanted on and in the eye, where its 60 electrode array stimulates the retina of somebody who has gone blind due to retinitis pigmentosa. Images are fed to the implant via an externally worn camera, which is connected to a visual processing unit and antenna. The vision so provided is very rudimentary, but does allow patients to identify shapes and even large letters. Since 2016, Second Sight have also been developing a visual cortical prosthesis called the Orion 1. This tiny electrode array is implanted into the visual cortex of the patient's brain, so bypassing their eyeballs and optic nerves. In January 2018, the first Orion 1 was implanted into a test patient. 
Like the Argus 2, the Orion 1 implant receives signals from an external video camera and currently allows its user to perceive patterns of light. Another developer of brain implant technology is BrainGate. The first BrainGate neural interface system was created in 2002 by a Brown University spin-off company called Cyberkinetics. By 2008, the hardware had been upgraded to BrainGate 2 and was being developed by academics from five universities supported by a score of institutions and foundations. The BrainGate 2 implant is a 4mm array of 100 electrodes that's surgically implanted. A decoder processes signals from the implant and in turn this allows the user to control an external electrical device. In 2008, a team from the University of Pittsburgh implanted a BrainGate sensor into the motor cortex of a monkey. Over time, the monkey then learned to feed itself by using its brain to control a robot arm. In May 2012, a team from Brown University implanted BrainGate electrode arrays into two paralysed human patients. One of these was a 58-year-old woman who learned how to use a robot arm to pick up a bottle, raise it to her mouth and take a drink. Clearly today, BCI implants like the Orion 1 and the BrainGate 2 are being developed to assist people with medical conditions that have robbed them of sight or mobility. Nevertheless, the possibility has to exist for more advanced forms of such technology to develop into sophisticated, non-medical, human-computer interfaces. In March 2017, Elon Musk announced a new company called Neuralink to develop ultra-high bandwidth brain-machine interfaces to connect humans and computers. It's therefore clear that interest in BCIs is rising, and in the future this could lead to some kind of cyborg fusion between human beings and machines. If you want to know more about that, you can watch my video called Cyborg Fusion over on my Explaining the Future channel. And if you want to know more about the future of computing more broadly, you can look in my book Digital Genesis. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.